Dennis Sarfate making his first appearance. What will you do to defend the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Welcome to the Green Dragon Tavern, where we talk a little treason. I'm Zach Lautenschlager. And I'm Dennis Sarfate. This week is the 79th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944. Um, it is a tremendous place to start any show. It's always something that I enjoy remembering, thinking about, and talking about. Um, the sheer scale of that battle is sometimes lost, although we often hear about it as the largest amphibious invasion in military history. Um, some historians contend it was the largest invasion in history, although it's hard to say because of the, our lack of counts in ancient battles. But just to put it into context... In the Battle of uh, Yorktown, which is where the Americans beat the British with French help, there were a total of about 25,000 combatants o overall. All told, about 25,000 combatants. Um, if you go to the Battles of Princeton and Trenton, which is the famous crossing the Delaware where Washington is standing in the boat in the painting, um, you're talking about slightly more than 10,000 combatants on both sides. Um, in the um, uh, D-Day invasion, there were over 156,000 infantrymen alone. That does not count naval personnel. 156,000 allied infantrymen stormed the beaches, facing 50,000 German troops. Now that alone, there have been battles that are larger than that, but that alone mm -hmm. as an amphibious invasion is that does blow your mind um, to have over 200,000 troops in an amphibious invasion. Um, there were, uh, let's see, over 7,000 ships in the channel, 7,000 ships in that small channel between England and France with over 195,000 more naval personnel between eight uh, allied countries. Um, and uh, by June 30th, over 850,000 men had been landed on the beaches that were taken on June 6th. So this, the scale is unbelievable. Um, you also look at it and see, now look, any battle is terrifying, and there are, there are uh, tremendous stories about uh, men that face death for, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but the, because of the scale and the sheer ferocity, um, I don't think I anyone can know what it was like without being there. I am fascinated by the stories and the, and the accounts of men who were there who later watched the movie Saving Private Ryan and said that is as close to you could, as you could get to being there without being there. Um, and so now I think we do have some feel for what it was like to land in those uh, landing craft um, we have to understand, many of you have seen the movies, but um, because of the setup um, and the way that the guns could be trained, um, those were kill boxes. As soon as the ramp went down on the front, you have a, 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 a boat with a, with a door on the front, and when that ramp goes down, um, it, it, you have a clear field of fire if you're in front of the landing craft into the entire, entire thing. Um, many craft were wiped out the, the men inside their landing craft were wiped out before they got out of the boat um, between the machine gun fire and the mortar fire. Um, and so just the, the sheer ferocity of, of the engagement was unbelievable. Um, because we are now 80 years from World War II, there are very few men left who fought. I'm blessed to have a grandfather who did and who would tell tales and so tell the stories and so I have a connection um, which changes things but how we view uh, what happened in our history has a huge impact on um, what what we do in future and what we do moving forward. Um, Dennis I know you had a grandfather in the war as well. Yeah my grandfather was in the Pacific Fleet in the U.S. Navy um, you know growing up and, and hearing the stories from him didn't really set in until I saw that moving Save It Private Ryan because you actually saw what he had been explaining. I, I couldn't visualize what he was explaining um, when he would tell me these stories, but man, he was 20 years old uh, when he was over there. So yep. I just think about where we are right now as, as, as a country, 
um, and what these men went over and did for us to fight in this war. Uh, I have so much love and respect for those veterans. And, and I, I think it really bothers me in this, in this day and age where we kind of throw out the senior citizens vote, like we, they, they shouldn't vote or they shouldn't have a say. And we kind of trample on um, the elderly. And I think it's such a shame because these are the men and women who dealt with this, who were alive during the middle of this. You know, my grandmother sat at home after they had just gotten married and didn't know if he was going to come home or not. You know, there was so much going on at that time where she said goodbye and we'll see if he comes back. But his name was uh, Stanley Sesnick, a, Pol a Polish American. Um, Love the guy. And I wish I could have spent more time with him as I got older. Um, he got to see me play in the big leagues, which was cool. He got to come to wow, Anaheim. That is awesome. But he died when I was, when, you know, I just got to the big leagues in, mm. in 2000 and, and five. So mm. I wish I would have spent more time talking to him. I wish I had him now. Cause I would have just, geez, I, he, he'd probably be like, Dennis, get away. Like I'm tired of telling you stories. Um, but man, the stories that he did tell mm. what those guys went through. Um, and I think, I think, you know, all of them for what they did and put themselves through. But the fear that must have been going in into those men when they landed on the shores and the, and the door would drop and just to know that you're sitting ducks. Like, think about it now. If no one would do that in their right mind, you know, as soon as that door comes, you have no way of knowing what's behind it. You're just going to get shot. Um, so really graphic to see it in Saving Private Ryan, to see what they went through. But just a time in history that we can't erase. We need to, we need to, teach our children about it and, and celebrate these heroes for what they are. Having respect for what has happened in the past is such a key vital part of human existence. And mm -hmm. it is a huge part of being a decent human being. Um, I say it that way. You could also say it's a huge part of obeying God and being a Christian um, because God commands respect. In fact, it is the first commandment of the 10 that deals with people. We call it the mm -hmm. second table of the law. Um, but that, that respect for people who have done things before us is not normal. We humans are born thinking that we are smarter than everyone else. And we've talked about this before, but I see it in my kids, I see it in myself. And the necessity of recognizing that people who came before us um, some of whom are still alive, and so we see them at the end of their years when they are not strong, when their bodies are, um, are waning, not waxing. Um, and and we, the, we think, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm better than I can do things that they can't do without recognizing uh, perhaps what they did do in their day and the wisdom that they have from that and the wisdom that we can gain. It is also inherently why simply to recognize that someone before me has probably done cooler things than I'm doing right now. Um, that's an important thing to recognize. And so, you know, we refer to, it's been popular to refer to the generation that fought World War II as the greatest generation because of the amount of sacrifice. But you know, they didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't spring from nowhere. And I am excited when I see how the hard times of the early uh, 20th century, the early 1900s, especially the Great Depression, which many of the men who fought in World War II were just children um, it, during that era, how that shaped them into being the type of men and women who would stand up and do what is right no matter what and who would march into certain death if necessary. And when you listen to their commentary, when you listen to World War II vets of both sexes who, who talk about, that, okay, this is... This is what it was like. You hear it again and again. Well, we just had a job to do. I'm not. I'm nothing special. I just. I did my job. I had a job and I did it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't pretty. And I don't even like talking about it because it was so terrible. Um, but we had a job and we did it. And they'd say it over and over and over and over again. My grandpa said it. Um, my grandfather was 17 when he went off to war. He had to have his wow. folks sign for him. Um, and he went into, his name is Lautenschlager, it was my dad's dad, so they wouldn't let him go to Germany. <laughs> they sent him to the Pacific um, as well, and he served uh, in the motor pool, carried a Thompson submachine gun, cleaned out caves, and went out and, and you know, did what he needed to do to keep the vehicles running. He invaded the Philippines with, uh, with MacArthur, 
And the stories wow. that he would tell were fantastic. There were a lot of stories he never would tell. He would look at me and he would go, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I don't think you want to hear about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wish, I wish he had. I wish I had been older and he had been here longer so that I could tell him, Grandpa, I really want to know. I'm a man and this is important and I want you to tell my sons. But we have to be that link now. And that's the point. Um, to recognize and see how, what do we do? How do our sons know what to do? Um, You remember what it's like to be a 12-year-old boy. We all do. Mm -hmm. And one of the main things that I think all 12-year-olds are asking is, who am I? How do I do things? What does it mean to participate in, in this grand adventure? And the context that comes from, okay, this is what human beings have done. This is how God relates to us. But also... Here, is, here are some specific things that have, that have happened that you are connected to because this is your grandfather, this is your great-grandfather, this is your father. This, is, this, this connects you. It can't be overstated. And the impact on society, I know we talk about it a lot, um, and it's become a cliche in America to talk about, well, the building block of society is the family. But it is true. It is true. And it, fatherlessness is one of the leading causes of the level of uh, uh, epidemic crime that we see in some places today. And so Mm -hmm. you you can be fatherless because you don't have a father. You can also be fatherless because your father didn't, doesn't tell you the stories. So you're missing a chunk. You have a hole. And so for us as fathers and speaking to fathers and grandfathers, you need to tell your children the stories. You have to do this, and you have to remember, okay, this is D-Day. We're going to talk about that. We're the, this is an important day for our family. These, these things are important. And then recognizing that this is going on all around us and all the people around us and looking at the people around us and going, hey, here's an important story from that guy's history. Here's an important story from this people group's history who lives close to us. That's the context. That's, that's, that's how we have a society in which we actually have some mutual respect and we don't just run, <laughs> you don't just have rampant crime. Re- respect is the core of, um, of self-governance, respect for others. You respect their person, you respect their property, so you don't take their stuff and hurt them. And that respect grows from being told, hey, here's what other people do that's cool, way cooler than what you're doing, but you have the opportunity to do it. That's the grand adventure. Mm-hmm. That's the cool thing in life. So that's why we yeah. like talking about D-Day, for example. I remember one thing that stuck with me in my whole career when I was young um, was that was the party, the party kid, you know, in college. And, and when I got drafted and my grandfather took me aside one day and he said, you can howl with the wolves, but you better be ready to soar with the eagles. <laughs> and so... That was one thing that I, I never took for granted. So no matter what I did the night before, I was up that next day and mm. I worked harder that next day because of what I did the day before. Wow. And granted, he, he wasn't saying, go out there and sin and do all the things you want to do. He was just saying, hey, if you're going to put that time in at night, you better be ready the next day. There's no sleeping in and being weak. Yeah. And uh, I, I kept that all the way until now. I can't mm. wait to tell my son that. Yes. You know, yep. so well, yeah, and we, need, we need to take the wisdom that we learn right. from those men who went through just uh, uh, something that we can't even explain, right? Yep. Um, and we need to pass that on to our children, our grandchildren. Well, and that's the core of respect for fathers and mothers. It's not that they're perfect. As you just laid out, the advice, that, that advice could be taken imperfectly, right? It could be... Mm-hmm. But to recognize the good that is there, the good that is intended in which it is from, you know, from where it is said, and to apply it well within the framework of, of uh, biblical morality from our perspective, um, that is honor for fathers. And that is what makes a, um, a, uh, that is what makes a decent human being able to live in a decent society. Mm-hmm. Amen. We are very pleased to uh, introduce our uh, newly minted editor at The Sentinel, Ben Zeisloft, is joining us officially on Monday of next week as our editor. Ben is formerly a staff writer from The Daily Wire, and uh, if you look at the stats, I'm proud to to brag a little bit that he was one of their top uh, authors and click getters, (laughs) and so we are very happy Ben, to have you uh, join this team. Uh, And thanks for joining us here today. 
Yeah, guys, great to be here. So um, Ben joins us at a pivotal time when we are working on several big projects that we will be able to reveal soon. Um, and Ben will be taking on uh, the editorial work uh, covering um, all, of, all of those aspects. Um, I'm very excited about the vision and the mission that Ben brings. Um, ben, can you walk us through what your perspective and, and uh, why you decided to uh, work for the Sentinel? Absolutely, yeah. I'm really excited about the Sentinel because it's not um, a, a traditional news outlet in the sense that we're going to pretend that we don't have a bias or we don't have a worldview. Um, you guys are both believers. I'm a believer. So we're, we're Christians and we're, we're looking at the world through that sense. And we're also conservatives. So we're going to be uh, covering conservative politics from that lens as well. Um, but because we're Christians, we have the groundwork to be uh, true and accurate in what we say and, and tell the truth because God can never lie. Uh, and also to be as highly um, quality, producing the best quality we possibly can in everything we do. So I'm eager to see the sense it'll improve with that and, and to be the best possible outlet we can be because we're competing with many other news outlets. There's no shortage of news outlets, conservative, liberal, or in between uh, looking for your, your viewership and, and your dollar. Uh, so we're going to be fighting for that hard and offering the best commentary and, and things that other outlets aren't working on, uh, hopefully, hoping to earn that respect from you. Ben, I think that the greatest thing um, of reading your work and, you know, you actually covered an article on, on Zach and I on the abortion side of things is when you write and when you are bringing your your case of whatever subject you're talking about, it is Christ-centered. You can see that your foundation is rooted deeply in God's word. Um, you've never wavered from that. You never apologized for that. I think what you're seeing now in a lot of areas where they're conservative outlets is there's this Christless conservatism uh, that's going on. Um, your Charlie Kirks where they say one thing like, you know, the Bible's the greatest book ever written. And then they follow it up with what well, I really don't read it because I'm sitting here advocating that there can be gay Christians. Um, I really appreciated how you stood firm on your foundation rooted in Christ. And I think that it really showed through your work where there is a difference between a Christian morale conservatism and just being a conservative. I think if you take God and you take his word out of your your political, you know, beliefs. Really, you're just a little bit better than the other side. Is it's just your political um, acumen is a little bit better. Maybe you agree with more of the conservative fiscal stuff, but when it's not rooted in God's word, it really is pointless because you're just as bad as the other side. So, do you see a big difference in that? As far as like, did you see that coming when you first started with the Daily Wire? Did you see that this separation of actual conservatism that kind of stayed away from Christ and God? Yeah, I think we've seen that for a long time. It's, it's no mystery to everybody that, you know, the Republican Party in 2015 that was against gay marriage is not the same Republican Party we see today that's letting more and more of the, the rainbow flags and so forth into into the equation. So uh, if you're not rooted in, in something, you're, you can fall to anything. I was actually just reading in, in uh, Luke chapter 11 today how uh, Jesus says, if you cast out a demon and you clean your house and sweep it and, and make sure it's it's plain for everyone, uh, the demon's going to come back with seven worse ones. So you're you're worse off than when you started. So um, I think the the myth of neutrality is something that everyone can plainly see is ending. Uh, and mm -hmm. conservatives and Christians ought to be no different. And I think it's important yeah. to differentiate between neutrality and uh, bias or un being unbiased mm -hmm. in that case. That would be the straight yeah. cross. Um, when we say no, no neutrality, that doesn't mean we can't be unbiased. In fact, the way to be unbiased is to recognize that you, there is no neutrality and that it, it is the interplay between uh, people who believe things and then having some decent respect for differences in beliefs. And so um, the, the American media has not only imbibed but is promulgating, they are the primary proselytes for the belief that um, you can have whole entities that really don't have a belief system. That's kind of what they're saying, even though they mm -hmm. would say, well, no, we actually do have a belief system, but we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to base anything on it. We're going to say that in order to be unbiased, we just have to kind of pretend we don't have a belief system. Um, now, look, everybody knows that if you watch CNN, they're going to be more left leaning. And everybody used to know that if you are used to think that if you watch Fox, it'll be more right leaning. Well, look, huh. is there a right bent at Fox still? Sort of. 
there still is. I mean, you still have a sense. Do I think Sean Hannity is a, uh, is a um, shining light for conservatism? No, he never has been. He never has been. And if you watch Sean Hannity, expect that from him, you're going to be disappointed. Doesn't mean that I hate Mr. Hannity. Uh, but that's just the reality. And the, the problem that we have is that, uh, that espousing this or, or promulgating this idea that in order to be unbiased with the news, we kind of have to just pretend that we don't have any beliefs at all. And we certainly can't talk about it or, or let it flow from our, our belief system. That just ends in silliness. It ends in absurdity. Everybody knows, and it ends in dishonesty. We, we kind of pretend that's not the case. Look, one of the best um, modern um, reporters or newsmen, from my perspective, was Walter Cronkite. Not perfect, certainly. We disagreed on, I would disagree with him, even though our lives were not, did not overlap, I don't think, not by much. Um, and, but the reality is, I respect his, the way he did things and the way he went about things, because he had a belief system, he, he, he didn't try to hide it, and he strove to be direct and honest about what is actually going on while acknowledging that he had beliefs. And I believe that is the core of what news should look like. And look, Mr. Cronkite didn't invent that idea. He came from an era when that's what newsmen did. And you can go all the way back to the uh, American War for Independence, in which the pendulum kind of can swing a little bit. And if you look at uh, news during America's founding and directly after in the early federal era, um, it was it was completely on the other side. You have a full pendulum swing to the other side in which everyone is just openly biased. And we're saying things that just really aren't true because, hey, it fits with our bias, right? And you have newspaper editors shooting and killing each other in duels during the Jefferson um, Adams presidential election. That's the third presidential election because they were saying libelous things based on their bias. Um, and so we've, you, can, you can have a full range here, but for the majority of time in America, it, it has made sense, and it does make sense to say, okay, number one, we have a perspective. As a news outlet, we are human beings who have a belief system because, newsflash, everyone does, and everyone has makes faith-based assumptions. I am a presuppositionalist, and I would argue that everyone else is too, even if you want to deny it. You do presuppose things. And so acknowledging that and acknowledging that there is truth, and I view, view it this way, and this is my perspective, and now I'm going to turn and say, now I'm living in a world with people who have very different perspectives from me. Many of them have very different. Some of them are so different that we are going to have a hard time getting along on any level because they believe it's okay to, for example, kill me. If we're talking, and then there are, there's always going to be somebody in the world who wants to kill people like you. Um, that's just get used to it. It's just a reality. There's always somebody. Let's just face it. But that's very rare. That's an extreme example. Most of us, we differ on things, and we can still talk. We could even be friends, and it's not a big deal unless we start making it, you know, attacking one another, but that's not necessary, usually. Um, and so... Now we can come from our perspective, we can be open and honest about it so that you know why I am saying what I am saying, and now it forces me to be honest and go, well, am I allowing my perspective to color things? Am I reporting the, the honest truth of what's going on here, or am I coloring it a bit? And so it's that constant tension to not color when we're reporting and to be honest about a perspective when we are commentating. Uh, and that equips the reader or the listener to be able to say, well, I know what this guy's perspective is because he's honest about it. I know what she thinks because she's honest about it. And so when he or she is reporting the news, I can be uh, I can have a, a lens from which to look at this and go, oh, okay, if there's going to be coloration, I know where that'll come from. And so that enables me to, to adjust for that. The reality is you're always going to have to. When we pretend that we don't have a perspective, you end up with a let's go Brandon situation in which we can hear through, mm -hmm. the, through the news reporting that they're not chanting let's go Brandon and the reporter's sitting there going, yeah, you have to listen to me. I'm telling you what these people are saying even though you can hear what they're saying. That's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, I think that's so true, Zach, because even now when I listen to someone, whether you're a conservative and, and you have a huge following, you know, um, you're seeing them twist scripture to go along with what they believe, even right. though they sound conservative. Yes. You know, I, I, I heard there's one lady that calls herself the Patriot Barbie and <laughs> she's fighting all the same things that I agree with her on until yesterday she posted this thing of Jesus hugging this LGBTQ person with pride haircut, rainbow haircut. 
And I said, no, that's, that's actually blasphemy because you're, you're saying that Jesus takes her in and, and loves her sin because she's showing her pride right there in her life by coloring her hair. Um, and she just said, well, he died for everyone. I said, well, I don't know if you're reading the scriptures very well, but Jesus clearly didn't die for everyone or there'd be no one in hell. And so you can see this emptiness of people are just conservatives now. That's fine. You can just be, hey, I agree with you conservative fiscally. I don't think we should start wars. I don't think that uh, kids should be mutilated. I don't believe that babies should be killed. But don't take God's word and start twisting it to form your own kind of religion. Like you're seeing some of these big names across the board and, and MLB baseball, you know, these players that come out as Christians and then they say, well, Jesus is love and we, he wouldn't want to fight against the, the sisters of perpetual indulgence. You know, we'll just put a faith night the next night. Like, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus was pretty clear about calling sin out for what it was. Um, and he went to die on the cross because of it. I, I feel like it's cowardly. And I feel like sometimes conservatives just throw some scripture out there just to keep the Christians coming. Like, oh, this guy's Christian. I've heard people all the time tell me, oh, he's really Christian. And then you listen to him, you're like, definitely not Christian. Definitely not Christian. I, I've listened to this person three or four times now. They're not Christian. Um, and I think they do that for a reason. I really do. Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. And American political conservatism does not come from a vacuum. It comes from the Christian worldview, a lot of its presuppositions and a lot of its ideas. So, you know, somebody can be conservative in the United States and just be divorced from the actual foundation of it. But the problem is, you know, it's going to collapse into sinking sand unless you regain that foundation. I think that's the story of the United States over the past several decades is us losing the foundation, but trying to keep uh, the actual structure built upon it. And I think, you know, projects like this, the Sentinel, um, other other projects are going to be an important part of reclaiming that and helping the citizenry to think biblically about matters like this. Um, it's also not to say that we're going to have a Bible verse in every single article, but the, the worldview is going to be there. Uh, you're going to know where we're coming from. And we're also not saying you should never read Fox News or even MSNBC or another outlet that radically disagrees with what you say. I think it's, you know, you should be considering what all sides have to say and, and uh, taking it for the face value. I think the problem is with the neutrality aspect and pretending that CNN doesn't have a worldview or Fox News doesn't have a worldview or we don't have a worldview. Uh, so all that in mind, you know, read us and, and read other people, but we're going to we're going to compete for your viewership. Ben, we're really excited to see uh, where this goes and uh, excited to have you uh, taking the lead in uh, on the on the print and editorial side. And thanks for joining us today. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Ben. You know, the neutrality issue, a big problem, part of the problem with that is uh, it, it leads to uh, an inability to deal with nuance. Now, look, human beings will always have trouble dealing with nuance and saying, OK, there is complexity here. We have to be able to to deal with all of this, the, uh, everything that's going on. Um, but I think that that, that uh, is exacerbated by pre trying to pretend that we could live in a neutral world. A neutral world, if it exists, which it does not, but the entire concept of neutrality means there's no complexity. There's no, there, there is no balance here. It's all just one thing. And so we don't have to worry about it. And so, you know, looking at it and saying, look, there is, there is some nuance here when we talk about what does it mean to have a nation that has biblical or Christian foundations? What does that mean? Does that mean all of the men who, and women who were involved were Christians? Does that mean that everybody now is a Christian? Does that mean that every, the, the founding documents were perfect? Does that mean you have to be a Christian to participate? Uh, what does it mean? And the, the answer is, it means that the principles, from my perspective, when I say America is a Christian nation, which I do believe is true, it does not mean that everyone is Christian. It doesn't even mean that the majority are Christian today. That's not what it means. Mm -hmm. It means that uh, the founding principles are based on a biblical concept, uh, and that that biblical concept is Christian in the sense that Christ has come. He is the Son of God. And his word is, uh, is meaningful. It means something. This was the perspective of the Founding Fathers, uh, else it would not be in the documents. Um, and mm -hmm. it isn't just that, well, we have to prove that the Founding Fathers had personal relationships with Jesus. Well, look, I have been, I appreciate the work of, of people who have gone through and demonstrated how many of the Founders did have relationships, Christian relationships with Christ. Um, 
But that is not what makes America a Christian nation. You go to the Constitution, you ask, okay, where do these principles come from? How, where, what is the, how do these exist? Um, what are they from? Um, that is what we're talking about. That is where it comes down to um, understanding that these principles are biblical in nature. If you like the American Constitution, then you like biblical principles. And that, that's where the discussion has to be. And so this is where, as you know, if, if we're coming from a Christian perspective, we just need to be honest about it. Um, so that is a big part of the picture from my perspective. You know, moving on to, to something similar to what you just said, you know, John Root has been going back and forth with cast and um, cameramen of The Chosen you know, a show that has wanted to say an accurate and biblical portray of Jesus Christ and his life. Um, a lot of controversy surrounding that show recently when there was a, a mini pride flag found on set. Um, John called it out what it was, right? And saying, here, you're trying to have a biblical approach to the life of Christ and to portray it accurately. He wouldn't have allowed for that right he, he wouldn't let people to sit there and celebrate this lifestyle that we're seeing during the month of june but since he's called this show out not only has the director defended it um now cast members have been caught wearing pride t-shirts so it's really just turned into this debacle right you where you have a show that was supposed to be the Christian life of Jesus Christ. And now it's become this propaganda thing for the LGBTQ alphabet. And, and they're now they're bullies, you know, now they're coming after people for disagreeing with what they're doing. I think you're seeing that this is what I was talking about earlier. You're seeing this a lot where someone claims to be Christian, but their actions don't line up with what their beliefs are, are coming out of their mouth. And I think that's where it's, it's sad for me is pe a lot of people watch the show chosen. You know, I'm sure the, the show Chosen has been responsible for people coming to Christ, right? God will oh, use yeah. all kinds of means. You know, he'll, he'll, like Jeff, Pastor Jeff Durbin always says, you know, he'll, he'll make straight blows with a crooked stick. Well, in but, fact, the only thing he ever does with humans has an element of error on the human side, right? That's right. And so when you, when you see this show now, it's almost like they're doubling down. Mm. Like, hey, we're a Christian show, but we're going to show you that Jesus loves the LGBTQ. He actually loves a whole month dedicated to that. You know, it's like, man, the pride, pride month, the pride that they exude out of their bodies is, is, is embarrassing. It really is. They have no idea of what actual Jesus was speaking when he was on, you know, with the disciples and teaching them. It's like, they just kind of throw that part out. They cherry pick their verses. They line up exactly what the verse is that will help them prove their side, Jesus is love. And then they won't show the verses before it, the verses after it. But how can we have a, a Christian show that's supposed to be this accurate portrayal of Jesus's life, have a pride flag. And now the people that are on the show, now they're supporting this, this actor's wearing this t-shirt. And it's just, it's just like, no one cares is like is this is show going to keep going on or are they going to get canceled like Bud Light and Target has? Right. Well, and I have some sympathy for Dallas Jenkins, um, the director of uh, The Chosen. Um, I have some friends in the film industry who have posited publicly, have suggested publicly that this was an effort to force Jenkins uh, to uh, approve a homosexual behavior and a homosexual lifestyle. Let's address the, you know, the question, does Jesus lo love homosexuals? Well, uh, yes, Jesus does love people who um, are in, currently, in some cases, in a homosexual relationship. Um, mm -hmm. He is calling them to leave it, and that is an act of love. Um, from a Reformed perspective, um, and this is something we can have a theological debate. It is a theological debate over did God, did Jesus actually die? Did God send Jesus to die for everyone on earth? And does that then mean that it that his efforts failed? And that's mm -hmm. that 
um, God is thwarted, or did God send Jesus to die for people that he chose? Well, that it is a, it is a foundational um, pr- uh, principle of the Reformed understanding of Scripture um, that God did not send Jesus to die for everyone, that Jesus did not die for everyone from God's perspective, right? And that's what we're talking about. The challenge is that, and there's some of the nuance, right? From our perspective, we don't know. We do not know. That is why God commands us to preach the gospel and to evangelize to everyone. It is not a question of whether or not we're sitting here deciding who's in and who's out. Of course not. Mm -hmm. Of course not. Is God? Well, he does say in his word that he does. I'm sorry you don't like it. I'm not sure I like it. I mean, it just in a vacuum, right? I'm not going to sit here and say, mm-hmm. I think it's great. It is God. God gets to do what he wants to do because he is God. And if we don't respect that, then we don't understand what God is. We don't understand what it means for him to be God. And so while this is not a theological podcast, um, we are going to talk about uh, all things American political, cultural, and business. And it's pretty hard to talk about culture this month without getting into not only religion, but sexuality. Um, so welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations. Um, this sure. is what it is to live in Pride Month in uh, the United States of America. Um, but so we get down and we have to talk about, well, look, when, when Dallas, the director of the show, says, um, you know, we, we are not a church, we will hire people who maybe have a different perspective. Some people may be homosexual. Look, I respect that decision. I'm not saying that's a mm-hmm. good decision. I'm saying I would necessarily, I don't know how that all works when you're making a, a, a major Um, show like The Chosen. I've never done that. Um, So I'll step back and say, you know what, There's, uh, I'll let him make his decisions. Um, But if we're going to use that to say that Jesus approves of a homosexual lifestyle, we are lying about God in the same way that now we have left us saying that God is they, them. God is she. God, well, now hang on. Are you going to use someone's preferred pronouns or not? Because God has told us. He doesn't have preferred pronouns. He has chosen and stated pronouns, and it's he, Mm -hmm. him. This is how God describes himself. And so the level of disrespect and and dishonor to God, look, if we're going to say he doesn't exist, that's probably a better perspective than saying, oh, he exists and he's a she. I'm not Mm -hmm. saying that either one's good, but if if we're going to say that, well, the chosen is a Christian show and Christianity means that you have to accept the perversion of homosexuality and just live with it and say that it's good and say you can make those choices that's where this is going that's what the homosexual bullies are doing right now and they're doing it to jenkins and jenkins is doing what he's doing i don't agree with how he's doing it um, but i don't think the core problem is that oh my goodness someone flew a pride flag off camera right Mm -hmm. that's not really the problem the problem is what does that mean I mean, yeah. we could be filming in a situation where that's just a bystander. Now, in this case, it wasn't. It comes out that there was more. These are stat. These are people who are on staff at the, you know, actually producing this show. They are cast or crew members, and so even though it's not part of the show itself, it is part of the production of the show. So, what do you do with that? Well, we have to be able to stand up and say, "Hang on, that's not Christian. It is not Christian to." Um, to approve a homosexual lifestyle. It is not Christian to approve the sin of homosexuality. It is a sin. I'm sorry, you, we don't get to determine what is and what is not. We don't make the rules. God makes the rules, and he writes them down. You can read them. It's not hard. Um, yeah, this has kind of been across Twitter, too, is, you know, I saw some tweets. There, the guy who plays Judas Iscariot mm-hmm. on the show <laughs> was wearing a pride flag T-shirt and people were just like, Oh, you're not breaking character. Really good of you. (laughs) You know, like people are recognizing it now. Like, okay, Christian show, this probably shouldn't be on it. You know, I referred to it a couple of weeks ago. If there was a a Muslim documentary of the life of Muhammad, Oh my goodness. You would never see (laughs) a pride flag on there. Matter of fact, you go and look in New York right now, what they're doing with the school boards when these Muslim and Armenian families are saying, Hey, listen, we don't want our children during this month. We don't want them in the classroom if there is going to be portrayal of the LGBTQ alphabet and all that nonsense. And it's, it's turned to fisticuffs after some of these, these school board meetings, like literal fights out in the street, which is so, which is wrong. And I don't think anyone should fight something over it. Remove your kid from school. We've been saying it forever. Homeschool your kids. 
right? Yeah. You're, you're sending your kids off right. and they don't believe, even though public school is one Muslims, thing, government school is something else and government sure. schools, right? Yeah, that's right. Muslims, you know, are, are true to their beliefs, whatever you want to say or right. not, they Respect probably that. follow, they, and I do because they probably follow their beliefs more than most Christians consider that who consider themselves Christians follow theirs. Well, and you're pointing out that right. there are Armenians there as well, not Armenians. And you said Armenian, but sometimes we have to differentiate and say, yeah, there's a difference. Not Armenians. Armenian <laughs> is, that's a religious perspective, a theological perspective named yeah, after a Armenians. Dutchman. Armenians are from the part of the world that we usually think of Muslims from, and they are Christians. Armenians yep. are overwhelmingly Christian. And so yep. you have people who come from a, uh, a non-American, non-United States a background. They are not from the States. They were born in Armenia, and they are Christian. They have a different cultural perspective. They're willing to stand up and say, no, we believe this, and we're not going to back down on it. You know, and I think that that's, that's where we can't succumb to the left when we say what you're doing, God says what you're doing is sinful. It's not me. I'm saying God says that, that homosexuality is sinful. doesn't mean it's, it's a, uh, that my sins are more respectable or better in God's eyes. I'm not saying that. But we do, God does say that homosexuality is an abomination. He says that. Okay, so what do you do with that? Well, the left says you're just being mean. You hate people. You're responsible for people committing suicide. And we have to say no. I didn't make the rules. This is mm -hmm. what the Bible says. Now, you may not like the Bible. We can debate that. But you can't just stand up and say, I hate you because you hate people, which is the yeah. only answer they have. You are literally Hitler. Um, the so, most loving thing you can do is tell someone they're perishing, right? And they're going to go to hell if you don't turn around your life, whether it's an adulterous husband or whether it's a, a murderer or a thief. You, you tell people the truth about Christ. You live, you know, the gospel message. And, you know... I think you really believe, you see people are saying enough's enough. Like this whole right. LGBTQ mob yes. bullies, yes. like Target's been punished, $15, 15 billion. <laughs> yeah. You know, right? I was in Walmart Bud the Light's other day. Bud Light's lost 20% of their market share, right, exactly. 20%, I, 23%. I never look at domestic beer because I think... I don't drink it. I think it sucks. It tastes like water. <laughs> I don't even like it. I don't even like Coors Banquet. I mean, I used to live next to Coors in Golden, Colorado. And look, I'll drink it. It's fine. I'm not saying I'd spit it out. But it's not my favorite beer. So I'm always overlooking at the other stuff, right? I have a mm -hmm. neighbor who he helped me do something. So he, you know, he wanted some Coors Light. And so I was giving him a hard time about drinking, but he's like, nah, nah, you know, I, I drink Coors. So I went over and was looking at it. And just in my little tiny Walmart, and sure, could it be chance? It could be chance. But you could see people had buying, been buying every other domestic beer except for Bud. Bud was untouched. And I have a hard time believing that they had just stocked Bud and nothing else because it's middle of the day at Walmart. They don't stock during yep. the day. There was nobody stocking anything. Is it anecdotal? Yes. But the numbers demonstrate. That was just last, yesterday afternoon. I was like, <laughs> well, I guess it's happening in Leighton, Utah, too. People are tired of, you know, I, I saw a thing, uh, I think maybe the Daily Wire, Matt Walsh, or maybe Graham Allen, who I follow on Twitter or Instagram. It was a guy in the back of a truck, all rainbowed out, holding another man in with whips oh, and yeah. all this. His butt cheeks are out. Oh, yeah, like, he's wearing a G-string. And they're just I down the street. Yeah. Like, you can't go in, down. If oh, a yeah. woman would do that, if there was a man in the back, in the of, back a, of a truck yeah, with a woman float. in the same position, oh, yeah. it, that's horrible. it would be outrage. You would have people yes, calling the shit. cops. But here, it was celebrated. People were taking videos up, and I was like, where are we as a culture yeah. when this is seem, like this seems to be okay, like where we can allow this to take place with children possibly seeing it? Like, right. Well, that's why it's Whatever called Whatever happened month, right? to decency. And it's not just, you know, the, what does woke mean is a discussion we've had a bunch of this week in the editorial, in the, you know, in the editorial room at, at the Sentinel, which is a chat uh, because we all live in different places. Um, but uh, we were discussing what does woke mean? And I think that it, it, it's nebulous, so you can't nail it down. But I believe that woke primarily means, if you boil it down to its essence, woke means forcing everyone else to accept my radical leftist perspective and requiring that they say it. You have to say it. You have to do it. Silence is violence. If you just stand by and, and just let Pride Month happen, you're contributing to, to um, homosexual uh, suicide. This is, that's wokeness, right? Now, is it okay? Are we okay 
with homosexuals who just want to live their lives and do their things and be left alone? Uh, well, in, it depends on what we mean by okay. Do I think that I need to be over there telling them this, that, and the other? Well, no, not really. Um, if I have the opportunity and it comes to my knowledge and I have the chance to say something um, and could do so in a way that would be beneficial, then yes, I will. Do I believe that the police should be posted in their bedrooms? Well, of course not. No one believes that. Not even the Old Testament, which is the mm-hmm. harshest <laughs> civil law against homosexuality. You had to have two witnesses to the act to do anything, which means if you're willing to live quietly and do your, live your life, which is what some of them want and what they all say. What, what did they say before Obergefell? We just want to be left alone. Lo- you know, we mm-hmm. just want to love who we want to love. We want to be left alone. Well, that's not what's going on, is it? Now we have to have nudity and, and some of the worst abusive violent sexual acts in public and that's pride Mm -hmm. okay this is what pride is about you have to accept it you you have to let us ram it down your throat and yes i get the double entendre unfortunately it's accurate in this case Uh, you know that's what you have to do yeah and it reminds me of when oborgefeld right when they were trying to get marriage same-sex marriage that was just the beginning like they really didn't quite care about marriage because if you look at their marriage stats in gay relationships, it's awful. There's more divorce than I saw a study a couple of years ago where they have more divorce than 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 heterosexual marriages, right? Mm-hmm. Which I find very odd, not odd, but it's just they're promiscuous, right? It's a it's a sinful well, lifestyle. Somebody was doing an interview in which uh, there was a man saying that we just you know we're, we're there's monogamy, there's homosexual monogamy, and I'm all for it. And the reporter asked him, but isn't being, you know, sleeping around, being a swinger, doing it with everybody, isn't that kind of the fun of being a gay man? And he just smirked and, well, you know, and then they went on with their talking points. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I think the, and the wokeness started, and or after that, then you have 2020 where you had the riots, and, and then it was, it didn't matter, you know, if black Americans were going and burning down buildings you heard the left say, well, they just want to let out their frustration. We need to let them let out their frustration. I was like, well, wait a second. <laughs> Something horrible happened to an, a man. Yes, right? legitimately. He was killed. Cases. Like he was murdered by that cop. No, no one's going to watch that video and think yes. otherwise. If you do, then you're lying. There are multiple cases but, and it happens. Yeah, but you can't allow for now, okay, all, so, and now if everyone right. can just start killing so the they can start is, breaking into right. places you can do whatever you want you're gonna go no. hurt other people and take their stuff and they, they're not involved it's crazy to do it for attention it's outrageous it, it's it's and this is it's straight up marxism marxism says that uh it's a good thing to destroy other people's property for no reason at all uh, that is what marxism is uh in mm-hmm. part so you know i wanted to mention one other thing about the chosen before we move on um, and that is to examine uh, the non-homosexual <laughs> or gay pride reasons for questioning what's going on with the chosen, mm-hmm. right? Because we have to look at that. Okay, okay, here's a cultural phenomenon. It's very popular. It is true that people have come to Christ that legitimately, it would appear, just in the same way that people came to Christ and are still coming to Christ with the, the Jesus film, right? And the way it took over the world and is still being played in thousands, I believe it's thousands of languages, um, it, it is, it is uh, more than a few hundred uh, different languages, and people are coming to Christ all over the world. And so that often is used as an example or a reason for why, see, this is actually a good, godly thing. Well, you touched on it earlier, and you said it, God doesn't have to have perfection. He chooses not to have human perfection in order to use uh, humans or what we make. And in fact, God chooses to use imperfect humans every time. Every time he uses a human, every time he does something good on earth that involves us and the stuff we make, it involves some measure of mistake, of wrong, of sin, right? That Mm -hmm. is the reality. We all acknowledge there, there are very few people on earth who will not acknowledge that nobody's perfect. Everybody acknowledges, Christian or not, that nobody's perfect. And so Mm -hmm. to say that because God uses something that means it's justified is laughable. I'm sorry. (laughs) That is just plain silliness. I am so thankful that God does use imperfect means, that he does land straight blows with a crooked stick, because then he can use me. Then he Mm -hmm. can use me. 
And so Amen. then we have to look and say, okay, but what does the Bible say about what we're doing? That's how we tell whether or not something's right. Not, oh, God's using it, so it's right. That's silly. So the Bible tells us in uh, the second commandment that we are not to make graven images uh, of something that we worship. That if we are going to worship it, we don't make pictures of it. Now, I realize mm-hmm. that that is not even a mainstream um, uh, evangelical or Protestant perspective anymore, but it is. It was a core part of the pro- of Protestantism from the very beginning. I recognize that there are massive branches of Christianity which do not acknowledge that that's what the second commandment means. But I have never heard mm-hmm. a good argument as to why. And so I'll just put it out there: when I read the second commandment, I come away saying I am pretty sure that God forbids portraying Jesus. I'm pretty sure that that's what that's saying, especially 100%. if we're going to put, you know, do his face. Um, now, what about the old Ben Hur movie, right, where you have these very reverent shots of somebody's feet in a toga, right, or or robe? Well, I don't know. Um, we could have a debate about that, and that would be an interesting debate. Um, but there is no question. You, I, it is really, really, really hard to do anything except discount the second commandment for the chosen. Sorry, guys. But I think that's true, and I challenge you to look at it. Here's another problem. Anytime we have Jesus portrayed saying something, and we are putting words in his mouth, we are claiming to speak for God. When God opens his mouth and the Son of God says things, that's God talking. Okay, that's fairly obvious. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus didn't ever say, hey, I'm going to go take a leak. Okay, look, I... I, he was a man. He was a he human being. He did pee. Um, yep. But do we get to portray uh, and, and put words in his mouth um, and say you know, and have you know season after season after season of Jesus saying things that he that we have no record of him saying? That's not true with any other biblical character from my perspective. You can have movies about any other human being, and we all agree that they were that we we're all fallen sinful human beings. We just covered that, and we agree. It's no problem to, to, to write about things that they said as long as it's not contrary to the biblical record, right? I don't have a problem with that. We could debate it, but I think that that's where you draw the line. But when you are going to put words in Jesus' mouth, you are claiming to speak for God. God has already done that. God speaks for God. He has his word, and he says that if you add to it, there are very serious consequences. So, I'd even double down on that, you know, because if you go to the end of the, one of the gospel books, John... He even says right. there were many other miracles that he did, but if we had to write them down, there would be the book would be un, un, unending. Right. There was an option so to do that. Like, God could have. Yeah. He could have made but movies. That's, but that is God's word, right? right? You don't get to right. just take it and say, well, here's here's some of the miracles he, he might have done. I'm going to add this in and right. have my take on it. Yes. And the you know the chosen has done that a lot. You know, well, my Bible, yeah. Jesus speaks, and there's red letters. And so, okay, <laughs> that's what Jesus said, and that's what the apostle wrote down. Right. I am not adding to it, right. we nor do I take it, it off. I always tell the girls, I said, you can't paraphrase Correct. what Jesus said. I always make them say the whole verse. Yeah. Right. We're not going to say, <laughs> oh, Jesus said something like, no, this is exactly what Jesus said. If you say something different, then you're blaspheming. You're, you're actually lying. Right. Because you really, don't what, know. And what does it mean to take God's name in vain? If we're going to say this, God said this and he didn't say that, or we have no record, we can't, we can't say that he said that, then we are claiming, we are speaking in his name and it is in vain. So, mm-hmm. sorry guys, I think that you also have uh, a, a third commandment violation there as well. Um, so, it is, I'm not sitting in judgment in the sense that I think that everyone who makes the, the chosen is horrible and a horrible sinner. No, I'm not saying that. They are no worse than I am. That is for sure. Uh, but we do have to acknowledge that God's word does say things. And we do have to acknowledge that it, in most cases, is fairly clear. We can have a debate over whether or not should we baptize uh, the children of believers or should we wait until they profess faith. Dennis and I would have a debate about that. We could have a debate further. We could bring Jeff. And then we could have a legitimate debate about that because the Bible is not abundantly clear. Um, But when it comes to things like, can we have pictures of Jesus? Can we put words in Jesus' mouth? I think it is clear, and I challenge anyone to come up with an argument that you are honestly, um, uh, logically happy with. Not just emotionally Mm -hmm. happy, but you can square the circle and say, nope, this makes perfect sense, and it's not just me kind of fudging a little bit here. 
I think you have to fudge in order to come up mm-hmm. with the chosen, and that's completely outside the rest of it. So, you know, is that an unpopular possession? I'm sure that it is. My, I have family members who strongly disagree, Christian family members who strongly disagree with my opinion on that, and I respect them for it. Um, but they also, I also haven't had any good arguments for why the, why the Bible's wrong there. Yeah, and so that's, I think, you know, getting off of the chosen and going to <laughs> mainstream Finally. companies, right? Like we're just going to mainstream companies now. Right. And you're seeing the boycotts. I, I think it has to be people, not only they had enough, but they're like, wait a second. Like if I'm claiming to be something, if I'm claiming to be a Christian, like I love God, I want to serve God. How can I actually submit to this worldly culture and try to stay new? Because there's no neutrality, right? As soon as you start to say neutrality, you're giving to one side or the other. You can't say, oh, I'm, I'm for God and his word, and then say, but I, I'm accepting to the LGBTQ because I have a friend or a family member that is, and I don't want to hurt their feelings, right? Or vi- vice versa, you know, you're going to be like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an LGBTQ member, and I have Christian friends, but, you know, they say Jesus is love, and so they're accepting to me. There, there's, a, there's a line that you draw and you're on either on the left or the right. It's it's pretty simple. You can't be in the middle. And the groups that are trying to appease to the mob and the bullies of the LGBTQ movement are starting to. You're starting to see like, wait a second. Companies are starting to lose money, right? When when companies start losing money, their board members get very upset, and so you start seeing this wokeness. You know, like Jada took the girls to see Disney last night, the mermaid movie. It's fine. You want to have a different yeah, aerial. Big deal. It's fine. <laughs> big deal. They changed some other things in it yeah. too, right? Probably but improved this, it. That was never my favorite yeah, princess this, movie. <laughs> this isn't, a, that's not a woke idea. A woke idea is having a transgender person on the cover of your, your beer bottle or, you know, representing it and then throwing it out into everyone's face. And so now every time they have to see a commercial, it has to be in their face. Yeah. You know, it's making a person that you employ wear something that's against their religious beliefs. Yep. Right. You're seeing all of this play out right now and it's not winning. It's a, it's a, it's a losing battle. Like you're losing and I'm not talking losing little, we already told you about the number of money they've lost. But if you go to the LGBTQ plus site, it tells you all the brands and media being boycotted. And the list is pretty extensive. You know, Build-A-Bear, Target, Maybelline, Ulta Beauty, Hershey, Innocent, The North Face, Halifax, Lego. I mean, there's, it's endless. And I think, yeah, because, you know, last Christmas I saw a commercial for Ritz Crackers and it was a dude putting on lipstick and a, a, his boyfriend coming over and introducing to his mom. And I'm sitting here like, what does it have to do with Ritz Crackers? It right. has nothing to do. They're pandering to a group that's so small in number just to be accepted, just be, oh, they get it. Ritz crackers gets it. I think, what are they, Nabisco? Yeah. It's they Nabisco. get it. And so you're sitting here and you're like, well, did that really help them? Did that commercial help them? Because I guarantee you this Christmas, they ain't coming out with that commercial. Well, yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> You can observe what's going on in uh, other countries, and you can look at places where it is unquestionably unprofitable to change your logo, for example, to incorporate some uh, gay pride um, uh, imagery, right? Um, And you can look at those same logos. Yeah, it's not happening. The the multinational companies are not changing their logos elsewhere. That tells you something. It tells you that it's about money. If it was about principle, they'd just do it everywhere and and suffer the consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Um, They fear that, or they believe that by, by... espousing this uh, this worldview publicly, that it will benefit their bottom line. And when it doesn't, they are quick to reverse. And that's what happens with Target. That's what happens with Bud. Uh, the, <laughs> the MLB had a, a gay pride logo for, what, about five minutes? And mm-hmm. uh, it changed back real fast. They took the, the rainbow and put uh, blue and red back behind the, uh, the guy, the, they, the batter hitting the ball, right? And mm-hmm. so um, this, is, this tells you that that's what this is about. And so 
why is it now that they're caught in the horns of a dilemma? Because they're trying to take a position and appear to be, uh, we're, you know, we're principled, we're taking, princ- you know, we're taking a principled stand, and then when they get pushed back, they retreat, and then they get pushed back again from the homosexual bullies. And that was the pink news that reported all of the uh, homophobic sellouts like mm-hmm. Target and Bud and the MLB, et cetera, et cetera, Build-A-Bear. Um, so what's happening? We're discovering that there's no neutrality. We're discovering uh, anew, again, as if we didn't already know, as if it wasn't unknowable, that um, you can't actually operate in a world where you don't have an opinion, that companies do have to come from somewhere. They do have to have a perspective, and that if we're honest, we say, well, we have this perspective, and then we respect the perspective of others, and which means we can make decisions about not pushing one or other perspective if we want to. Mm-hmm. That is an option. You can do that. If you own a company or you, <laughs> you are an owner of that company, let's say, if you're on, or maybe you are a controlling interest and you serve on the board, you can choose not to. Is it a good idea? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but choosing to take a position and then uh, realizing, oh my goodness, this is not profitable, it just puts the lie to this idea that um, we could work, we could operate in a, in a neutral fashion. You can't. It doesn't work. That's right. And you know, the MLB one's pretty interesting because you had a, a bunch of players reach out to their representatives, whether it was their agent or their agent agencies, and also to the Players Association. In, in Commissioner Manfred's uh, statement, he makes that every, every religion, everything, we're, we're trying to be inclusive to all religions. And so the Christian players were pointing out, well, you making us wear a logo or to represent, be represented by a logo that goes against our religious beliefs is not inclusive so actually you're in in violation of your bylaws of the con of you know major league baseball and the players association the bargaining agreement all that they you know they fight over every four or five years so what you had is the mlb got called on it and you know good for them to say you know what we aren't we aren't being inclusive to the christians and so we're just going to stop doing it and i think that's that's the right play because you can't say oh you just got to do it. I don't care. Wear the jersey. Wear this. Now the team can. Toronto, like I said, we're going to see on the 16th of June if Anthony Bass wears that wears that jersey with the Pride logo. But MLB took their logo down saying we're not being inclusive because even if they d- take it down, it's not like they're not saying that they're respecting the LGBTQ community. Exactly. You know, <laughs> it's like they're just not shoving it down everyone's throat. Right, we can let, and and we I can think that's the issue. What it is is, is when it's forced upon you. Like, what if there was a, a Pride Month for adulterous men? You know, this month we're going to celebrate all you men that just can't help themselves and and have multiple wives or multiple girlfriends and sleep around on your wife. People would be outraged to be like, "Oh, you male chauvinist pigs!" <laughs> and you it know, would be true, <laughs> and it would be true, a hundred percent. And I wouldn't want to celebrate that. I don't want to celebrate pedophilia month and this and that. Where does it end? Where does the line end? Do we just celebrate everyone's lifestyle? Because I guarantee you, I can name some people. You don't want to celebrate their lifestyle. Yeah. You know, (laughs) mass murder. Most of the people walking in that parade that I mentioned earlier, we were wearing weird stuff. Like one guy had like a fake baby head on, you know, like a mascot. It was like a baby's head. And the other one had like a lion's head. I'm like, what is going on? These are grown men. Like put the childish stuff away, right? <laughs> like, what does it say in Romans? God gave them up to a debased mind. Well, that's exactly what you're seeing play out every day on the streets. When you're going to one of these parades, it's people with debased minds. They're not right. Something's wrong with what they believe. You can't act like something you're not. Agreed. That is Pride Month. Pride Month is having to deal with Romans 1 over and over and over again. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It is. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. We'll see you next week.